Hello, Waynesburg, and welcome to Court Center. I'm Scott Stewart. And I'm Pot Scanvel. And today we have a special feature for you on the worldwide leader in courts. In today's Court Center special, we'll be taking a look at one of the most important Supreme Court cases of all time. That's right. Our federal government was created with three separate branches, executive, legislative, and judicial. Before this case, the judicial branch seemed to be inferior compared to the other two. However, in this classic case, a certain Chief Justice had something to say about that. In the 1800 presidential election, Thomas Jefferson, the leader of the Democratic Republicans Party, narrowly defeated then current president John Adams of the Federalist Party. In an effort to disrupt the transfer of power, John Adams, just two days before leaving office, signed the Judiciary Act of 1801 into effect, allowing him to pack the federal courts with Federalist judges. Talk about a bad beat for Jefferson. <laughs> One of the appointees was Maryland businessman William Marbury a strong advocate of the Federalists and President Adams. However, Marbury never received his commission from then Secretary Marshall before Adams left office. The real issue came when the new president, Thomas Jefferson, instructed his new Secretary of State, James Madison, not to deliver it. Marbury filed suit against the Jefferson administration, leading to this landmark case. We now turn it over to Becky Shank, who will chronicle this case in our Court Center special, Marbury versus Madison. It was March 3rd, 1801, the night before Thomas Jefferson would be sworn in as the third president of the United States. The Adams administration was in a serious rush to get all of the commissions signed and delivered to the appointed judges. However, as the night was winding down, the situation began to look grim, and it looked as if Secretary John Marshall would not get all of the commissions delivered before the transfer of power concluded. Time was running out. Secretary Marshall, got more commissions for you that need delivered. Thanks, Danielle. I appreciate your help. I just wish we hadn't given Jacob over to Jefferson. We need him to get these commissions delivered on time. I'm sure everything will be all right. Who is it, Danielle? Sir, your brother's here. He's right outside. Don't be shy, James. Come on in. Hey, John, how are you? You look like you're in a bit of a rush. Which is Sam. Glad you're here. I need your help with something. What exactly do you need help with? I need you to deliver the last of these commissions. Can you do that for me? Certainly. I'll have them delivered right away. <sighs> yeah, that's a lot of commissions. What exactly have you guys been doing? Why haven't you gotten these delivered on time? <laughs> Don't blame us. We had this thrown on us last minute. Well, you do know Jefferson's getting sworn in tomorrow, right? <laughs> of course we know that. That's why we're trying to get everything done as soon as possible. Man, Adams is not making this lame duck session easy for you. First, he appoints you to be Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, and then he, he has you doing all these petitions at the last second. Well, it's part of the job. have to be ready for anything that comes my way. How about this? I'll take half the petitions, you take the rest. Yeah, sure thing. You and I each take half. The names are on the letters, so you should know where they go. Danielle, I think that's good for tonight. James and I can take the rest from here. No problem, sir. Are you sure you won't need help delivering the rest of these? <laughs> Don't worry about it. You've been a big help for me these past few days. Go get some rest for the inauguration tomorrow. Appreciate your help, James. <laughs> Maybe my time on the Supreme Court will be as crazy as this lame duck period. However, John Marshall was wrong. Although he and his brother James had delivered many of the commissions that were signed, they had accidentally left the commissions for William Marbury and three other appointees on that very desk. A little over nine months after Thomas Jefferson was sworn into office, William Marbury filed suit against Secretary James Madison for repeatedly refusing to deliver their commissions. Representing them was former Attorney General during the Adams administration, Charles Lee. Both Lee and Marbury presented their case to Chief Justice John Marshall, a case that would prove to be too enticing for the Supreme Court to pass up. So, what can I do for you, Charles? Well, Your Honor, I would like to present a case that regards something you might be acquainted with. And what might that be? Well, it involves the commissions President Adams signed his last few nights in office while you were acting Secretary of State. Uh, you remember those nights, correct? <laughs> yeah, I remember that night. Hadn't really crossed my mind until you just brought it up. But what about these commissions? 
<laughs> they should have been delivered months ago. I even had my brother James help me out that night. Well, sir, Mr. Marbury and I are here representing three other appointees from your former boss. And who are these men? Dennis Ramsey, Robert Ho, and William Harper. Now, just like William, each of them were nominated and approved by the Senate to be justices of the peace, but they never received their commissions. <laughs> yeah, I can see why you're worried. But I believe this is issue for the president and his staff. Well, sir, that's the problem. William, why don't you tell him what happened? Well, Your Honor, my three colleagues and I, we went to Secretary Madison to see if he knew about the commissions, but he said he was too busy and to go see Jacob Wagner in the chief clerk of the State Department. <laughs> of course he'd say that. And what did Jacob say? He said that he didn't know anything about them either and to go visit Attorney General Levi Lincoln, and he was also no help. We even petitioned the Senate, but were ignored. <laughs> Geez, does anybody in D.C. know where anything is? And you know what? I think I'm also regretting having my brother help me out that night. All right, gentlemen, I understand the seriousness of the situation, but what case would you bring to the court? We would have the court deliver a writ of mandamus forcing Secretary Madison to deliver the commissions that we believe we have the constitutional right to receive. Yeah, the more I think about this issue, the more I want to know what the Constitution would say. All right, gentlemen, we'll hear your case. Come to committee room. Uh, what committee room do you usually meet in? I know I have it in here somewhere. Ah, oh, yes, committee room two. Be there early tomorrow morning. Thank you, Your Honor. We'll be there first thing. Your case better be good, Charles. After presenting their argument, the court agreed to hear the case that would come to be Marbury v. Madison. After the case was accepted, the news spread all throughout Washington and a heated debate ensued on Capitol Hill between the Jeffersonian Republicans and the Federalists. The Republicans believed that the executive and legislative branches had the same judicial power as the Supreme Court to declare laws or actions unconstitutional. They wished to repeal the Judiciary Act of 1801 and take away the Federalists' overwhelming influence in the judiciary. On the other hand, the Federalists believed that the Supreme Court had sole judicial authority they wished to maintain their political power in the judiciary and block the Republicans' repeal bill. This heated debate would ensue for roughly one week. Why are you Jeffersonians adamant about the constitutional intention of a strong, impartial judiciary? That's because the Supreme Court does not have the sole power to decide what laws are constitutional or not. Congress and the President have the same authority as our highest court. Exactly. Article 3 gives Congress the power to establish rules and procedures for all tiers of the federal court system. If the pending repeal bill is unconstitutional, then so is the Judiciary Act of 1801, because it changed the court system by abolishing circuit writing. What utter nonsense! All you care about is power. Congress should not have the authority to remove a judge for political purposes. That would damper the independence of our judicial system. You're one to talk about power. Your party and your president were the ones that passed legislation to pack the courts with Federalist puppets. And besides, why do we be more judges anyways? The number of cases in the docket have already been decreasing. You're exactly right, Stephen. You also know the judges shouldn't be held up in Washington two times a year, isolated from the people. That's why we're going to pass a law requiring judges to ride circuit all around the country and be more in touch with local laws and customs. That's right. Unelected judges with no accountability shouldn't hold that amount of unchecked authority. Well, as far as the surrogate riding goes, riding rapidly from one side of the country to the other doesn't really seem like the best way to study and preserve the law. I agree. That makes no sense at all. This is simply political deception, and you're just trying to silence the courts from expressing their opinions. Listen, all you Republicans want is to destroy the independence of the judiciary. This senior creating will lead to similar violence under the French Revolution. Not at all. We simply believe the most powerful check on the legislature is not the judiciary. It's the people of the United States who elected us. You're wrong. The Supreme Court must have the power to overturn an unlawful action taken by Congress. There is simply no better check on such authority. And the Constitution agrees with us, and so will the Supreme Court. After a week of debating, the Republican repeal bill was passed on January 22, 1802. A little over a month later, President Jefferson signed the bill into law, dealing a huge blow to Adams' legacy and the rest of the Federalist Party. Not only did the Republicans take over the judiciary, they also drastically changed the Supreme Court's schedule. They were not able to hear the Marbury case until March of the following year, virtually canceling the court's term in 1802. 
Eventually, a new session of the Supreme Court loomed with Marbury v. Madison headlining their first term in over a year. Good morning, everyone, except for James Madison, who decided not to show up. But regardless, let's begin with the plaintiffs, Harper, Ho, Ramsey, and Marbury. They're represented today by former Attorney General Charles Lee. The stage is yours, Mr. Lee. Thank you, Your Honor, and good morning, everyone. I'm here representing Dennis Ramsey, Robert Ho, William Harper, and of course, Mr. Marbury. Today, I will prove to all of you that the Jefferson administration, which sadly no one from that camp is here, wronged my clients. Before former President John Adams' term ended, he signed commissions for judges to be appointed, and they were never delivered. The State Department clerks at the time have testified that they could not remember whether or not the commissions were delivered. One of them even noted that the U.S. seal was affixed to Marbury's commission and returned to the secretary, but believes it was never delivered. I have both, uh, both statements here, and I'd like to submit them as evidence to the court. The court accepts this evidence. Thank you. I would also like to call Attorney General Levi Lincoln to the witness stand. Now, Attorney General Lincoln, what do you have to say about the status of my client's commissions, and specifically, did you see commissions in Secretary Marshall's office on the last day of his term? Yes, there were several for justices of the peace on his desk. And do you know who they were meant for? I don't know who they were written for, but what I do know is that the commissions that President Jefferson signed on the, last, on the first day of his term were meant to supersede the commissions in question. Hmm. Interesting. Seems there are some hidden events from this court. Thank you, Mr. Lincoln. That is all. Now, Your Honors, believe it or not, my client's commissions existed and President Jefferson withheld its delivery. Since Secretary Madison did not deliver the commissions, a writ of mandamus must be issued to force him to. Let, let me explain. Now, first, the Supreme Court can award a writ of mandamus. Congress gave this power in its very first session. Second, since the position of secretary is a public ministerial role, he must comply with the law, also known as the Constitution. The Secretary of State is a high officer, but he is not above the law. Consequently, he is liable for indictment. Mr. Lee, do you understand that it is the duty of the secretary to deliver a commission unless otherwise ordered by the president? Yes, but once a commission is signed in order to be sealed, it is the secretary's duty to deliver it. Madison must deliver the, 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 writ of man, the commissions. Now, after all of the evidence provided in this court, I think the Supreme Court's bound to grant it. All right, that's enough for today. The court will recuse itself to deliberate. We're here to answer three questions. One, does Marbury have a right to the commission he is seeking? Two, if he does have the right to the commission and that right has been violated, does the law allow him a remedy? And three, if he does have a legal remedy, is it a writ of mandamus issued by this court? The answer to the first question is that Marbury has a right to a commission to be justice of the peace. Once signed by President Adams, the judge position became Mr. Marbury's and it is the government's job to protect the property of individuals. To withhold this commission is an act this court finds unwarranted by the law and a violation of Mr. Marbury's rights. Now, do the laws of our nation allow him a solution? In fact, the laws do allow Mr. Marbury's solution to the wrong done to him. The only question left then is whether the solution Mr. Marbury is entitled to is a writ of mandamus from this court. We have determined that a writ of mandamus is the proper form of relief for Mr. Marbury. However, that mandamus cannot come from this court. Wait, what? Are you kidding me? Please sit down. According to the Constitution, the Supreme Court is an appellate court, not a trial court, and writs of mandamus can only be granted by trial courts. Congress gave the Supreme Court the authority to issue writs of mandamus in the Judiciary Act, but in all issues between the Constitution and a statute, the Constitution is superior. This court is intended to be the decider of these such conflicts because it is emphatically the province and duty of the judicial part department to say what the law is. 
The judicial branch is equal to both the executive and the legislative branch in authority, and when laws conflict, the courts get to decide on the operation of each. This court has decided that though Mr. Marbury is entitled to his commission, and the laws permit him to have a writ of mandamus, regardless of what the Judiciary Act says, the Judiciary Act is unconstitutional on that point. The provisions of the Judiciary Act of 1789, giving the Supreme Court the ability to issue writs of mandamus, violated Article 3, Section 2 of the U.S. Constitution by erroneously extending our power of original jurisdiction. So, I know he didn't directly say this in his opinion, but under those provisions from the Judicial Act of 1789, it was unlawful for the court to even be hearing this case in the first place. Is that right? Well, when you put it like that, I, yeah, I guess you're right. Man, he really had us in the first half of that opinion. I'm not gonna lie. I really thought we were gonna win this case. Trust me, everyone in the room was thinking the same thing. When it looked as if Marbury was about to score a significant victory, John Marshall threw him a serious curveball. At the same time, he also came to a conclusion that James Madison and the Federalists were not satisfied with as well. In essence, this is a case where neither sides at conflict came out victorious. Rather, it was John Marshall and the Supreme Court that scored a monumental victory for the Constitution and judicial review. Yeah, I think it's easy to say that Marbury versus Madison is one of, if not the most important Supreme Court case in the history of the United States judicial system. Oh, absolutely, Scott. This case set the standard for future cases that would require a strong judicial branch. Um, uh, cases that come to my mind are Brown v. Board of Education, uh, Roe v. Wade, Miranda v. Arizona, and even Bush v. Gore. Now, before we go any further, we'd like to welcome in expert on all things law, legal analyst Bill Ryan. Mr. Ryan, why don't you come on out? Thanks for being with us here today. Absolutely. I'm glad to be here. Now, Bill, talk to us. When it comes to Marbury, we've discussed this case's impact on judicial power. But what do you believe is the significance of this case on American history? Well, Scott, that's a great question. This case is seen by most people as the first significant Supreme Court case in United States history. And as you said earlier, it set the standard for judicial power. Before this case, the judicial branch of the United States government seemingly had no purpose. It wasn't until this case, when John Marshall laid down the law and established the power of the courts, that the judicial branch had its true identity. Now, Bill, to your point, this case did set the standard for future cases that would require a strong judicial branch. And as I said before, uh, Brown v. Board of Education comes to my mind, Roe v. Wade, Miranda v. Arizona, and even Bush v. Gore. So how did Marbury impact those cases, and how will it have an impact on cases in the future? Yeah, this case had a massive impact. You look at a case like Brown. Specifically, you look at the defiance of the Arkansas state and local governments in 1958 to disobey the Supreme Court decisions in 1954 and 1955 on segregation in public schools. It was Marbury versus Madison that gave the Supreme Court the power to determine that the state and local governments had to obey and respect their decision in Brown versus Board of Education. I'm sure there'll be many more cases in the future that look back to Marbury for precedence. It truly is a monumental case, and I think it's safe to say that if the power of the judicial branch were not established as it were in Marbury, then life as we know it in the United States would be much different. Well, Mr. Ryan, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate your insight on this case and your wealth of knowledge on the entire judicial system. Absolutely. My pleasure, guys. Thank you. Truly amazing to take a look at how this case has had an impact on this country. The impact it had early on, as early as the 1800s, and all the way up to the current day with any case that goes through the Supreme Court. Well, not only cases decided in the Supreme Court, but any case decided in a United States court of law has credibility in large part due to the outcome of Marbury v. Madison. Very true. Very, very true. 
Well, that's all the time we have for today. And once again, we'd like to thank you for joining us tonight on Court Center. For Pot, I'm Scott Stewart. Good night, everybody. Good night.